All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and taking a little bit out of time out of your evening uh, to get some short and sweet and free PD, as I like to call it. We are representing ISTE's EdTech Coaches Network tonight. Uh, my name is Katie Seamer, and I am actually the outgoing president. And this is the EdTech Coaches Leadership Team. Um, and then we have our Twitter handles on there too. So uh, feel free to connect with us. Let us know what you like, what you want to see more of as a part of ISTE's Ed Tech Coaches Network. Um, and we are who can uh, make that happen for you. And then this is the rest of our contact information to make sure that you are connecting with Ed Tech Coaches everywhere beyond these free webinars. We have our PLN homepage, of course, which is located inside of the ISTE Connects area. Um, you do have to be a member of ISTE to access this area. However, joining PLNs is free. So if you are a member of ISTE, you can have access to all of the EdTech Coaches resources that we house. We have a very active Twitter network. You can find us at, at EdTechCoaches. And please feel free to hashtag anything that you're learning tonight with hashtag ETCoaches. Um, we love to connect and share on Twitter. We also have a Google Plus community. We have a Voxer group, and then we also have a Remind group that you can join to receive a uh, monthly reminder about our monthly Twitter chat, which is uh, happens on the last Tuesday of every month at both 1 and 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time to accommodate people. Same chat, just two different times that day uh, to, to accommodate different schedules and different time zones. This is a part, this is actually our very first uh, webinar to kick off the 2017-18 school year. We started the EdTech Coaches webinar series last year, and it is essentially an extension of ISTE's conference over the summer. So we house or we host a playground at ISTE's conference with a number of smaller presentations, and based on some of the most uh, relevant information, the most popular sessions, we ask those people to essentially present that same exact thing again in a webinar format to bring the conference to those people who either couldn't travel and make it in person, or if you've been in person, you know there's just so much going on, you can't make it to everything. So we're, we're trying to extend that conference experience for everyone. So Nicole's going to kick us off tonight. I'll introduce her in just a second. Um, but we do, of course, have one almost every month of the year. We skip December and May because those are a little bit crazy times. Um, but this is just an overview of what we've got going on this year. And, of course, you can register for any of them for free at bit.ly forward slash ETC webinars 2017. And I will share all of these links with you in the chat. Um, in just a minute after I, I finish introducing Nicole so you don't have to worry about trying to scribble them all down really quickly. So without further ado, I would like to introduce tonight's webinar host. Uh, we have the topic is, of course, connect, grow, and share strategies for new coaches. And Nicole Zampano will be uh, presenting this awesome webinar for us tonight. Nicole is a national board certified teacher with 24 years of experience as a classroom teacher and as an instructional technology coach in a regional gifted center within the Chicago public school system. She's an adjunct instructor at three universities, and Nicole sits on the executive board of Illinois Computing Educators as the immediate past president, um, and she holds a master's degree in administration and supervision and technology and education. She's a Google certified educator as well as an Apple teacher. You can connect with her on Twitter at NMZampano. Um, and Nicole has tons of free time, obviously. So with that free time, she's been so gracious to uh, present our webinar for us this evening. So Nicole, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you, Katie. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So if everyone can bear with me for a second. All right, um, so I'm super excited to be here with you. Oh, you guys can see me. Why can't you see my screen? All right, let me come out of this. We wanna make sure, there we go. 
<laughs> Good. Okay. I'm uh, also trying to look off of my iPad so I can see a little bit of the chat, but Katie's going to help me out and she's going to get your questions. So um, as I was saying, I am super excited to be here with you tonight uh, to talk about coaching and how as a coach I connect and share and grow at the same time. Um, thank you, Katie, for the introduction. This is a little bit more detail. I should probably throw in there that I'm also a mom to 16-year-old twins who are both taller than me and, as you can imagine, balls of fun. But also along those uh, same lines with the introductions, I want to let everyone know I'm also one of the um, co-chairs for ISD 18 that will take place in my hometown of Chicago next summer. So I certainly hope that I get a chance to meet some of you out there. So um, basically the presentation that I gave in the Coaches Playground is broken down into three different areas. How I connect with my colleagues in my building, um, other coaches, how I grow as a coach, and then how I share my information as well. So we're going to take a look at some of that. When I'm connecting with colleagues as an actual coach, it's super important to build relationships. This is my 10th year out of the classroom, and it's my 10th year um, coaching. And four years ago, I left the building I had been in for 21 years in Chicago Public Schools, one building, and I moved to a new building across town, different school, completely different environment. So I didn't have any relationships with anyone in the building. I didn't know anybody. And as a matter of fact, that particular building had actually never had a coach of any sort. Uh, it's a regional gifted center, you know, no math coaches, no reading coaches. They brought me on as a tech coach, and for a little bit of the time, some of the teachers are like, well, why are you here, and what do you do, and why aren't you teaching my kids computer skills? It was a lot of building relationships, trying to connect with people just personally, just getting to know them and understand who they were, both as people and their families and their kids, and who they were as educators as well. So you'll see, in this presentation, I talk a lot about building relationships and how I spend a lot of time advocating for the teachers in my building as a coach. Um, it's also important to follow. For example, you can see on this particular screen, there's a little cutie pie that's in front of a green screen. This is a kindergarten student, and this particular teacher is phenomenal with photography. And just once in passing, she had mentioned to me, I'd love to learn how to do green screen. So I just kind of went with that. You know, that was a side conversation that she had mentioned that in because I had built a relationship with her. And I said, hey, let's just try it. You know, I don't know much about green screen and, and let's go with it. So her specific interest. And also one of the ways that I help to follow up or what helps me to follow up is I would actually create personalized technology plans with each teacher. I haven't done this in a few years because now I'm in my fourth year at the school. So this was something that I did when I actually came in just to kind of get a feel for, you know, what does each teacher know? What do they want to know? What kind of support do they want from me? How do they want me to communicate with them and so on? these different ways um, I've spent, you know, in this school connecting with colleagues. And the biggest piece for me has been um, advocacy. Um, another little side story about this school, as a regional gifted center, even enrollment school, so kids who live in the neighborhood get to actually go to the school. But then beyond that, you have to test into the, the gifted program if you get in. I was actually on my interview walking around the building with the principal and the assistant principal. It was funny because I mentioned something about Twitter and they said, well, we're not on Twitter. You know, and I said, oh my goodness, you know, how can you not be on Twitter in this day and age? And, you know, the principal politely said, why would I need to advertise? I have a waiting list of 1,400 students. You know, I don't need to try and get more students in the building. And, you know, when you're going through an interview, it's a little bit looser of a process. And I just kind of said, it's not, you know, it's not about advertising. It's about telling your story. 
It's about building your brand and, you know, sharing the awesome things that are taking place in this amazing building. So obviously I was hired um, and the principal was adventurous enough and cool enough to, you know, not having known me, allow me to set up a Twitter account for the school. So along with that, then I began to advocate for the teachers to open up Twitter accounts. Not all of the teachers had them. And to this day, even four years later, not all of them have them, but a much larger majority have them now. Different ways I would advocate. Um, I got a couple teachers on board early on that said, hey, all right, we'll give this Twitter thing a try. So what I would do is I would go onto Twitter, onto our school hashtag, or our school username, rather, and I would actually, as you can see on the screen, I would print off their tweets that they posted. I would just print them off and I would cut them out. And I created this little bulletin board that just basically explained to people us do a lot of things. It helps us teach. It helps us encourage. It helps us inform and connect. And I would advocate for my teachers by putting their message out. And then the parents got to see this. Other teachers got to see it. and that kind of you know helps to spread the word um also what i did because you know we did have again some teachers joining twitter that hadn't joined before some of them wanted to tweet with their students but they were a little bit nervous about it so i actually created a media form that would go home now in chicago public schools we have you know one massive media consent form for everybody but this added an additional layer of consent Saying, you know, hey, I want to start tweeting with my kids in my classroom. Here's my Twitter handle. Here's the type of things I'm going to be tweeting. Are you okay if I include pictures of your son or your daughter? And I have to say, we've had an amazing response. Um, I have a second grade teacher that completely just ran away with this like nobody's business. And now he tweets. He has his second grade students tweet every day. Um, so, you know, every year I get a couple more teachers jump on board that, you know, want this media consent form. And if anyone's interested, uh, you know, please put it in the chat and I can make sure I can send that out. Um, other ways that I advocate. So, again, as more faculty members come on board, I would start to create faculty member Twitter account lists and I would send these out, you know, hey, join your colleagues or, you know, make sure you're following them if you're on Twitter advocate for them in that way. Um, also, every year in the beginning of the school year, another level of advocacy, if you want to call it that, is I would create bulletin boards outside of my office that, you know, just basically gave the Twitter handles for every teacher in the building that actually had an account. You know, they get a kick out of seeing their picture up there. The parents can see it. So the parents can see, you know, which classrooms are tweeting and which ones are, you know, up and coming and so on. Um, and and that's just a quick way for me to advocate for them, you know, to and to give them a little bit of advertising so that hopefully other people will be able to jump on and follow them. And then along those same lines, um, you can see, left side i actually create a list and i put all of the teachers in that twitter list and that's more of an organizational thing for me because you know with so many followers on twitter following people i don't want to miss any of my teachers tweets when they come out so what i end up doing is i create a list and i put all of the teachers in there so if I'm on Twitter and I just want to see what my people are tweeting and I want to make sure, you know, I get their message out, I can go right to this list. And this also helps because when I get new faculty members that come on board and, you know, if they are fresh to Twitter and they've, you know, never been in it before, they need people to follow and people to follow them. I'll show them how to get onto my list and they can quickly see all of their colleagues this way. So I would definitely recommend that. Another way that we advocate through Twitter, and um, I try and help school climate and you know create community, 
is in the Chicago public school system, we don't begin with our students until the day after Labor Day. So our first school day is a Tuesday and our first week is always only four days long. So every year what I've been doing since I've been there is I will put up one Twitter prompt a day I'll email it to my teachers the morning, every morning of the first day and say, here's today's Twitter prompt. And then I'll schedule these for each morning of the, you know, of the week, a different prompt and classrooms can tweet out their responses. And I always tell the teachers, even if you're not on Twitter, you can still participate. And you can see two of the examples that I have up here on the side some of the teachers, if they're not yet on Twitter, and in some cases, even if they are on Twitter, they'll still do this. They'll put the prompt of the day on the board and they'll give each student a post-it and the kids come up and they put their post-its and you can see on the bottom picture, you know, the teacher snapped a picture of it and she might feature a couple of these and say, oh, you know, so-and-so wants to learn how to play the guitar and so-and-so is excited to learn about math and she'll pinpoint some of them but she's sharing that with our entire community over Twitter. And you can see from the example above as well, some teachers will actually take the prompt, print it out, and then have the kids put all of their responses on a giant post-it paper. And then if they don't have a Twitter account, they'll actually either take a picture of this with their phone and they'll email it to me and say, Nicole, can you post this for me? or they'll grab me and say, can you come take your picture of this and put this on Twitter? So it's a great way to begin to build community around this tool that I've been advocating for our teachers to use. And so far our parents, again, have loved it. So along with um, advocacy in terms of advertising for the teachers, it's also important, everybody loves to be thanked sometimes. So as a coach, one of the ways that I've done this is I've actually done little kudos for the teachers that have helped with technology projects and in a lot of cases in Twitter. You can see on the right hand side of the screen with the snicker bar and the little mints, um, all of the teachers that took part in that first week back to school in those Twitter prompts, I just put a small little thank you in their mailbox. You know, and it goes a long way. Um, people like to be appreciated even if they're doing something that they would have done anyway, you know, they always still appreciate getting a little shout out. And you can see on the left hand side of the screen, this is another type of kudos that I gave out. And I don't know, it always revolves around candy and that's okay. Um, but this is one, this is an end of the year Twitter activity we do. Uh, we're basically every classroom, basically every classroom in the school, but almost every student gets one slide in a Google slide and they have to sum up their entire year at our school in six words. And then what I do is I take all of these individual slideshows from each classroom and I put them in one gigantic slideshow and I share them out on Twitter. Um, in Chicago, we go to school, I mean, basically forever. Um, we're like the third week into June. So every day in June, I would schedule three different um, student slides with their six word memoirs, you know, a day, every day in June. And again, parents love that. And just as a thank you, um, I gave little candy bars, you know, to the teachers with the kudos for that. And then um, my last candy filled soiree was this was the or this was the prize. I don't know if you even want to call it a prize. This was the thank you to the teachers who actually participated in um, this year's back to school Twitter prompts. Um, and it was funny because I got a little flack, but it was friendly flack about, you know, the large print basically saying your tweets blue. Um, but as you could see, it's a bag full of bubble gum and in a little tiny print, you know, basically we finished with, you know, your tweets blew us away last week, you know, so just as a, a small thank you. Um, lots of advocacy things going on there. Uh, this is the last way also. This is, um, this summer we had an opportunity for any of our teachers that were interested in earning some extra PD, had a chance to go through uh, the Google Certified Educator Program. And we had four teachers that were able to complete it successfully. So, you know, not only giving them kudos and advocating for them via Twitter, you know, but once again, 
you know, I put lots of candy in their mailbox and also um, little tiny picture frames with their names, you know, just saying that they were Google certified. So all of the candy and um, all of the advocating like that. As you can see, I focused a lot on Twitter because again, the school didn't have a Twitter account at all when I first came in. And I certainly didn't want to come in the first year and say, okay, I'm going to set up this Twitter account and then I'm never going to revisit it again. It needed to be a living thing if we were going to continue to have it grow and become successful and have our parents buy in and more teachers buy in. So as a coach, there's a lot of follow up. Um, these are some examples of some blog posts that I actually created for the teachers. You know, I created an entire Twitter guide. So if they wanted to learn on their own or they didn't want to, you know, tell me that they didn't know about Twitter, you know, some teachers don't like to admit that. I created an entire guide for them and I just sent it to them and I posted it and said, hey, you know, check out this guide. Let me know if there's anything you need mid-year, maybe around the beginning of January, you know, I put out another email of, hey, here's a mid-year Twitter tweak. You know, here are some new ideas for you to use with your kids, you know, even including offline activities. And then you can see, you know, the last one on the bottom, maybe two months later, here's five tips and a bonus about how to tweet with your students if you haven't started yet. So I'm keeping the program, if you want to call it that, alive as a coach. Um, you know, I'm not spending obviously as much time as I did in the beginning getting it up and running. But every year, you know, I snag a couple more teachers and I get them on board. Um, for example, this year I have a first grade gifted teacher that said, okay, you know, it's time. And, you know, I sat down with her. I helped her set up an account. I got her to my Coonley list so she can follow all of our teachers. You know, she participated in week prompts so she got a little bag of gumballs you know and I'll pop in every now and again and I'll just point to something and be like oh you should tweet that out or oh this would make a great you know picture make sure you post that just as little gentle reminders so um, connecting as a colleague you know when I want to connect with other coaches one of the platforms that I use to do that is Google Plus, and you can see just a screenshot. Um, this is some of the stuff that I presented in San Antonio in the playground. These are some of the different forums that I participate in. I don't go to Google Plus as much as I probably should, um, but the beauty of it is I find that with all of these groups, I can go there and if I have any questions whatsoever, I get quick answers. So, you know, I absolutely love that even as a coach, I'm able to go out there and still learn from other coaches. Um, ISTE also has a number of phenomenal PLNs. You know, Katie mentioned the EdTech coaches. They are amazing. They've probably got the model PLN for ISTE, but there are some other ones that I also belong to. So, coming in, you know, this is the list of ISTE PLNs that I belong to. My list is going to look a little bit different than your list might look, um, given the roles that I had in ICE and, you know, other roles as an adjunct as well. But um, if you have not explored any more of the ISTE PLNs, I would absolutely encourage you to do so. And then last slide for how I connect as well. Um, these are different platforms that I connect on. And it's interesting, with Edmodo, I don't use Edmodo with students. Basically, I use it for the little communities that they have. So you can see from the list on the screen, these are some of the small communities that I participate in in Edmodo. And again, I don't necessarily go there often, but for example, if I put together a presentation like this one, I might go and actually, you know, put that up for other people to see so that I can share it out. Um, or I might say, hey, you know, I'm working on using Google Classroom. Does anybody have any resources? And so uh, it's interesting, you know, most people know to use Edmodo with students, but as an educator and as a coach, I mean, it really is invaluable to add to your, you know, resource toolkit as well. Twitter, obviously, you know, um, LinkedIn, Facebook a little bit, you know, there are some groups on Facebook that are educational. Um, I don't connect there a ton, but I do a little bit. And then believe it or not, with Voxer, and I know EdTech Coaches has a phenomenal Voxer group, 
I don't spend a ton of time on it because um, it's in for me sometimes even is overwhelming. It's definitely a great resource and I love that I can go to it when I need it. Uh, right now, I'm basically using Voxer, believe it or not. I'm co-teaching with another instructor uh, this term for Michigan State and her and I communicate over Voxer just as, you know, quick back and forth. But all of those are definitely ways that you can connect as a coach with your colleagues. So I will do a quick stop. Um, I'm trying not to go too fast, but are there any questions, Katie, that I need to know about or do we want to keep going and then wait? Um, there have been a couple of requests of links for you to share. So um, okay. if you want to, if you do have any questions at this point, guys, keep sharing them in the chat and I'll ask Nicole. Um, but the couple of questions, let's see, Kathy Aragema asked um, if you could post the form afterwards when yep. you were talking about, um, you know, all the Twitter stuff. And then Griffin Fam also said that he would love a, to see the Twitter guide that you made too. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, you can, if you, you can either post the links or you can share them with me in the group chat and then I can post the links uh, for folks in the live chat. Um, but so far, there haven't been too many questions. Guys, keep them coming though, again, because I'll collect them as uh, Nicole's presenting and ask her during these little question breaks. Awesome, yes, and all that stuff is on my blog, which I will show you how to get to, um, but if people want me to put comments directly in the live chat, I can most certainly do that when we are done. All right, so let's keep going then. Um, how I grow. So as a coach, as you know, you know, as an educator in general, I mean, you don't just go to school and then suddenly stop and then you're done. You know, we're all here and we're all in this webinar together because we're all continually learning from each other. So I find tons of different ways that I grow. And when I'm talking about growth, I'm, I'm not just talking about coaching only. Um, you know, I'm looking to grow as an adjunct so I can bring new ideas to my graduate students. And, you know, I'm learning how to grow not only as a coach, but just as an educator in general as well. So um, along those same lines, oh, and let's see. There we go. Um, this is always fun for me. So a little bit of background. I went through national boards and shortly before or after, I can't even remember now, I participated in an action research fellowship. So for a long time, I've been very reflective about my practice because both of those experiences. And I happened to come across an article that I read um, by David White. And a lot of you might remember way back in 2001, Mark Prensky came out with the term digital native and digital immigrant. And people thought it was profound and that stuck with people. You either knew it and you didn't. But as the years went by, people started to question, you know, are they really that black and white? Perfect example, you know, I am in my 25th year of teaching. So I am certainly not, uh, I'm not just starting out, we'll put it that way. Um, so in those terms, I would technically be a digital immigrant, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a digital native, I'd like to think of as well. Even though I didn't grow up with the technology, you know, I'm there. So because of all of this, getting to my long story, um, David White back in 2009 said, we don't have to be that black and white. You're either this or you're that. He said, what we could do is we can take a look at the internet and think about our modes of engagement, how we are engaged on the internet. And this is one of the things he recommends to do. And I actually make all of my graduate students do this activity. And I would totally recommend it for you too. He basically talks about taking um, a Google drawing or even a piece of paper and actually coming up with four different quadrants. You've got a professional, personal, you've got a visitor and a resident. And what that means is when you're a visitor, you are hopping on the internet, you're getting what you need to get and you're getting right off. You're not leaving any sort of trace, you're not opening up any sort of accounts. These are just quick visits to get what you need and then you're off and you're on your own. The resident side is more of your digital footprint. It's your accounts. It's where you spend time and where you, I don't want to say leave a paper trail because we're not a paper trail, but you're leaving a digital trail. 
What I did is I actually took the time, I went through my phone, I went through my bookmarks, I went through my laptop, and I went and I listed all of the places that I go on the internet. And then I actually decided, okay, am I going here for professional reasons or personal? Am I you know, spending a lot of time? Do I have a big presence in this area or am I jumping on and jumping off? And based on those applications, I was able to fill them out on this particular map. You'll see Twitter is bigger because I use it a lot. And you can see that it kind of falls in between the professional and the personal quadrants. Um, it's definitely more on the professional because I do try and keep Twitter mostly for professional, probably 99% of it professional. And, you know, something like Facebook, you can see it's a little bit down in the personal because, again, I try and keep that more personal. But for me, as a coach and you know, just as a person in general that, you know, there's always this talk of everybody's on the internet and you're on the internet too much, you know, get off of it. When I actually mapped it out and I took a look and I reflected, I was see that the majority of my time on the internet is for professional purposes. And you, you'd be surprised, you know, so this was a growing task for me. And this is one way that I learned to grow on my own, just kind of checking it out and mapping it out. And then believe it or not, I didn't feel so bad when I jumped on Facebook or, you know, I went to Twitter to see what the Kardashians were doing because I knew that the majority of the time I spend online is in a professional setting or professional purposes. And I'm trying to better my craft. So if, you know, people are interested, I would definitely suggest you try it out. Um, it's definitely a cool exercise to see where you're at and how you grow. Other ways that I grow, um, obviously PLNs like this, you know, the EdTech Coaches is an amazing PLN. Their book studies, you can see, um, I have that listed here, is probably, again, you know, a model book study. And I tell people about it all the time. Um, MOOCs. You know, if you are unfamiliar, uh, MOOCs definitely are a way that you can grow. And I've got a slide to show you a little bit about that. And then you could see different ways. You know, these are things that we do all the time, ed camps, you know, conferences, asking questions. With my PLN, and again, remember, this presentation was given for new coaches. Um, so you can see that I actually list the... PLNs that I belong to in terms of Twitter chats. I belong to a lot of other PLNs, but in terms of when I want to spend my time dedicated on Twitter for an hour to talk with like-minded people, these are the main go-tos for me. With MOOCs, um, probably the most popular one that I know of and that I've experienced is the Friday Institute. And every now and again, uh, different times of the year, they will open up different online courses. And you can see that there was a coaching digital learning, one that I participated in, in the spring of 2016. And it was amazing. You know, did I learn a ton of new content? Probably not, because as a coach, as you know, you know, we know a lot, we're exposed to a lot. But I was able to make a lot of connections and I was able to get new ideas and, and new methods and ways of bringing things to my teachers. Um, so if you have not participated in a, MOOC, uh, in a MOOC, I would definitely suggest that you do. Um, so moving on, books, this kind of MOOCs. Uh, so with books, obviously as a coach, a ton of reading. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I just, I love books. I love to read and I love to read about the craft. Um, I'm absolutely fascinated with statistics about social media and students and things like that. So I do tend to read a lot of things that have to do with that. Um, what I've also found that I've done, you know, I'd be reading these books and I'd have all of these highlights in them, things that stood out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is such a profound statement. And then I put the book away. No you know, besides me, that it was a profound statement for me. So what I started doing is I started going and taking all of my highlighted notes from each book and just transcribing them into a Google Doc. So you can see that's a real small um, screen here, but on my professional portfolio, you know, anyone's that interested in seeing like what stood out to me in each of these books can actually go on in my portfolio, you know, and click on it and um, so yeah, so that's, you know, books are a huge way 
that I grow as a coach. Then, um, moving on, any quick questions about growing or should we just keep going, Katie? Let's see, I don't see any questions coming in right now. Again, folks watching, share your questions in that live chat area over on the right-hand side of the video, and I will ask Nicole at the break. But for right now, you can keep going. Thanks for stopping. Awesome. Yeah, um, just about five more minutes, guys, and then I'll be wrapping up. Um, so finally, last part of the presentation, how I share as a coach. Uh, because obviously, we as coaches, we get a lot of information, and we want to make sure that we push that out, and we get that to uh, our teachers. So for me, the number one way that I share is I blog. I blog about being an instructional technology coach. Um, on my blog, when I first started doing this, I was asked to co-teach with students in the computer lab um, I came out of the classroom. So I basically had told the principal at a time, you know, I'm not writing lesson plans for you and turning them in because that's just ridiculous. I said, you know, I'll do lesson plans, but I'm going to blog my lesson plans. And he was super cool. He was on board with it. Uh, I actually got some teachers that year to blog their lesson plans as well. But I kept using my blog even after I stopped doing that for a year. Um, and 10 years later, you know, I've got over 100 blog posts on educational technology. You know, um, and so, for example, people had asked about the Twitter media consent form and the Twitter guide. All of that is here you know, all of that can be found on my blog uh, by just going in and, you know, searching the tag Twitter. Um, I can definitely, you know, provide that to you again. But this is the number one way that I share, not only with my teachers, but also with other coaches and really anybody that's interested in, in ed tech. Um, obviously, Twitter, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, I'm not on Twitter all the time. So, you know, as a coach and as a new coach, I mean, you don't have to do everything like 100% all the time. I mean, honestly, I'm on Twitter sometimes. I'll scroll through it, you know, um, when I'm in a grocery store and I'm in the checkout line. Or sometimes, you know, we're sitting down at night after work and the TV's on and I might just scroll through. So, you know, it's important for you to remember you can definitely share, but you don't have to be on um, with my teachers, I do create newsletters for them. When I first came to the school, like I mentioned earlier, there were no coaches that had ever been in the building. So not only were, you know, the teachers like, who are you and why are you here? But some of the parents were like, hey, you know, what are you doing all day long? So when I first started for the first two years, I would create newsletters that were geared more toward the parents and offered snapshots of this is what so-and-so is doing with technology or this is what's happening in this room you know make sure you're following us and doing such and such but years i've changed my focus so that this is more teacher based um, i still have parents that read it i still have parents that comment on it and that's great i love that but i write it now more for my teachers um, I try and say, you know, here's three new tools to try. And then I might say, hey, if you get a chance, stop in room 101 because they're working on that dinosaur project and they created these awesome audio booms. Check them out. You know, so it's, again, meant for anybody that is interested in ed tech. When I do do these, I also do post them to Twitter. So any other coaches that might want to see them has access to them as well. These are also um, placed on my blog as well. And I don't do these every month. Um, I tried to in the beginning and I found it was just too hard and I didn't want them to be, you know, just swept over in email. So um, I do them probably at least once a quarter. Because remember guys, as coaches, you're still popping in classrooms and you're still sending individual emails to teachers about specific things that you want them to know about. You know, this collective as a newsletter is just kind of a giant quarter wrap up. Keep a professional portfolio. And for my graduate students, I make sure all of, they, all of them have a professional portfolio as well. Um, so this is another way, you know, that I'm sharing content with anyone that's interested in ed tech or anything um, 
that they might want to know. And it's just great for me as a professional. You know, I mentioned earlier, I was in the same building for 21 years. So it wasn't necessarily like I had a portfolio to go find a job, but I had a portfolio because I had a one-stop shop for everything I had done in my 25-year career, which I think is important. Um, and then social media, as you can see on the screen, these are other ways. I've also um, remind with my teachers I haven't spent as much time on it lately as I'd like, but at one point I actually said, hey, you know, if you're interested in random tips, you know, sign up for my Remind account and, you know, I'll send things out. And the beauty of Remind is I could see who signed up for it in my building. So, you know, I might gear specific things toward them, you know, that I thought would be of interest. And I knew that those people that were in that room, they were interested and wanted to be there. Um, so that is something that I might actually try and get back to at some point. Um, so we will skip that. I will give you some final thoughts and then we've got a couple minutes, you know, to wrap up. Um, so let's, there we go. Um, so coaches, it's important to remember, um, as coaches, we're seed planters, you know, we're there to spark an interest in teachers and to set the stage and to help them along their journey. Um, it's not always glamorous. It's not always successful. And it doesn't always happen overnight. We don't get to see those little, you know, plants pop up right away. But it's important to remember that, you know, this is our role as coaches. And you can see I've got little examples down there, more for me. Um, Sam is a second grade teacher in my building that was not a tech guy at all. And he was, he's still is one of my biggest success stories at my new school. When I came on board and I pushed this crazy Twitter thing, you know, he was like, I don't want anything to do with this. But slowly he said, you know what? All right, I'm going to give this crazy lady a try. And Twitter has transformed his classroom. I am not kidding. Um, he is the one who now four years later with me there, um, he has his second grade students tweeting. They have their own account. They tweet twice a day. They have a tweeter of the day. Um, he has done projects, a great project that he did. He created a hashtag for the Chicago Fire uh, when they were learning about it. And each of his second graders tweeted like they were there at, you know, during the Chicago Fire. Um, it's really made him turn a corner in terms of excitement for teaching. And that was just a seed that I planted with him. You know, it's it's not all me. I got the ball rolling for him as a coach and I continue to encourage him. And this is a guy also who, uh, who you know, not only he wasn't in tech, he had never presented before. Um, so it's funny, as a coach, I present all the time. So, you know, I didn't think anything of it. And I said, hey, Sam, you know, do you want to present how you use Twitter with teachers? And, you know, he was like shocked and in awe. And he's like, well, what do I get? Do, do I get paid? You know, and I kind of laughed and I said, well, you get people that want to hear what you have to say, you know, and often he made the comment. He's like, oh, I, you know, I've never presented before. And this is a guy that had taught probably for a good maybe 10 years and he had never presented um, anywhere before. So, you know, I had to stop and take a step back and say, oh my gosh, you know, I, I had this reaction to him like, you know, what are you talking about, what do you get? And because you forget sometimes, you know, not everyone is as advanced as we are as coaches. Um, so I was able to offer him the opportunity of, let's put in for this presentation, I will do it with you, presentation and I will be there with you and stand up there with you and you tell your story. Um, so again, we're seed planters. And um, with that, that is all I have for you. Um, if you have any questions for me or you want to connect with me on Twitter, I'd love to hear from you. Um, and that's it. So um, Katie, I'm going to go ahead and give you the screen and come out of my presentation. Great, thanks, Nicole. So many good ideas. Um, we do have one question, and before I ask you the question, um, Terry, I am trying to share the link to her portfolio, and for some reason it keeps telling me that it won't share. Um, Nicole, would you maybe pull up that slide again that has the link 
It is just nmzampano, Z-U-M-P-A-N-O, dot Wix site, W-I-X-S-I-T-E, dot com, slash portfolio. So for some reason, I've shared it about 45 times, and it won't go through in the chat. So if all of a sudden all of those messages go through, guys, I'm not crazy. Um, <laughs> but we I just have a wire. Thank you. So, Nicole, while you're putting that up and then resharing um, your slide, we did have uh, kind of one question, good point, that I think could be something good uh, to get your thoughts on the issue here. Um, and that is, um, there we go. Um, Amy Shaw said it's her first year as a coach. Um, 15 years as an educator, and uh, she's just struggling to find out the best way to house information, uh, find for later resources that she finds for later resources for teachers. She's been doing bookmarks, Symbolu, Pocket, and that's kind of when you started talking about that you use your portfolio. Um, but I just think that she brings up a good point because I know that sometimes as coaches, we we think one way is the best way to sort of house things and share them, but it's not necessarily how our teachers' minds work. So I kind of feel for her and what she's talking about there. So I wanted to get your thoughts to share with the group on that. Yeah, it's it's a personal preference how you share and where you house everything. Um, my suggestion, and I would say congratulations on coming out and being a coach. Um, I will tell you a side note. I don't know if you're in the same building that you started in, but the relationship does change a little bit. You know, I taught for 10 years in a fourth grade classroom uh, and everyone would come in and be like, oh my God, that's great. Show me how to do it. And the minute I stepped out and I was a coach in the same building, a little bit. So kudos to you for the new role. Um, I would say don't put things in a ton of different areas. You know, go with what works for you and what you're comfortable with. And you can always change it, you know, later on. Um, I, let me think. Oh, another thing that I do, as a matter of fact, um, and I can actually try and pull it up real quick if you're interested, is um, I actually created a wiki, and let me go to it. Basically, when I find all sorts of links and things that I might want to present at a later date, you know, to teachers or, oh, this is an awesome resource on, you know, whatever it is, and I'm not using that right now, I pop it into a wiki. Um, and again, my wiki is public. You know, it's not nice and it's not clean by any means, but it's for me. You know, so for example, and I'm sorry about the goofy screen there, um, but for example, you could see Genius Hour. When I come across super cool resources that I think, ooh, I might use this at some point, you know, I just copy the link and I pop it over into this wiki spaces doc. You know, so this is one place that I kind of house everything, and then I can go back to it later. Here's a question. Awesome, thank you. And I hope you don't mind, but I shared the link really quickly in that in, in the chat too. So that one, let me. That one, won't, uh, it took it that time. So. Awesome. Um, there really aren't any other questions, guys. If you have any questions at all, um, feel free to keep them coming in the chat. I do want to make sure I want to flip over um, and share my screen quickly. Yep. Um, for those of you who would like to get a contact hour certificate, um, let's see, there we go. Um, it is bit.ly forward slash etc webinar feedback. And you can just fill that out. Uh, as a team, we like to collect some feedback on the webinars. Um, especially, please, this year is the first year that I'm doing it with YouTube Live. Last year, we used Adobe Connect. So um, I would love your feedback on, on how this format and the chat and everything went um, moving forward. Because if you absolutely hated it and it was terrible, then I will do some readjusting before we go through the rest of the webinars this year. Um, but if you fill out that feedback, there's a spot where you can put your name and email address, and it will then generate a contact hour certificate uh, for participating and email that to you so you can collect it for contact hours and all that good stuff. Um, of course, if you have any more um, questions, throw them in the live chat. Nicole and I will hang out for just a minute to make sure that we collect all of those questions. Um, and then, of course, don't forget to register for future webinars um, at bit.ly forward slash 
ETC webinars 2017. And honestly, I'm terrible. I forget uh, next month's webinar. It, uh, it, you have a public relations hat. It is a must for your tech ETC webinars 2017. And honestly, I'm terrible. I forget uh, next uh -oh. month's webinar. It, it, uh -oh. You have a public relations hat. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody likes to hear their own voice, right? Um, okay, guys. Well, thank you so much, Nicole. It has been um, wonderful having you kick us off um, with such a, a jam-packed with awesome information uh, webinar. Um, oh, thank you, Griffin. I will fix that. Um, I still have Adobe Connect in the survey, so uh, scratch that. It should be uh, YouTube Live. I will fix it. Thank you. Um, this is why we do this together, right? Two heads are better than one. But um, thank you, everyone, again, for spending some your Tuesday night with us. Um, hope everyone is safe from storms and bad weather, um, and we look forward to connecting with you in the future. Have a great night.